do not turn off the TV, the computer, the phone early today because there's a special treat coming up at the very end of the message. You will not, I promise you, will not want to miss it. The technical experts from this place, as well as all the musicians put together, something pretty awesome. I can't wait for us to show it to everybody. So make sure you stay till the end, all right? Stay till the end. We're talking about the end, the end times. That's what we have been doing now for several weeks. Today, we're wrapping up the series that we call Preppers, Preppers Part 3. As you can see, we got here on the stage with us all of our esteemed pastors and one particular expert, Ms. Mandy, right here <laughs> on end time events. And so we brought her up for her expert opinion. My expertise yes, yes. But uh, man, I tell you what, here's the deal. Um, we're talking about a lot of stuff this morning in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and I'm going to tell you, we're not going to get to all the nitty gritties. We're looking at it from the 30,000 uh, foot view, and so we're going to go through a whole bunch of things, but the cool thing about this is tonight you can log into a special Zoom class, but you're putting that together yes, for us. Yes, we're going to put a Zoom class together at 6 p.m. tonight. We're going to go for a few weeks. We're going to talk about the end times, yeah. and it's real simple. If you'd like to be a part of that, all you have to do is to email us at smallgroups at communitybiblechurch.com, and when you email us, we will send you a link and invite you to the group. Awesome, awesome, simple as that. So uh, definitely, we're going to whet your appetite a little bit with this today, but then log in tonight and those weeks coming forward. Preppers part three today, it's what we call prep forever and ever and ever and ever and ever till the very end or through eternity. Boy, I tell you, as we were looking here this morning talking about end times, it made me think of a couple of pastors that uh, were standing on the side of a road one day and they've had these big signs and one sign said, the end is near, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. The other sign said, turn around before it's too late. And after a little while, a car comes by and the guy sees the signs and he yells out the window, leave us alone, leave us alone, you nuts, and keeps on driving. After a little while, you hear a big splash. And that's when one pastor looks at the other and says, maybe instead of these signs, we should have just written, bridge out. Okay. <laughs> now, yeah, I, yeah, all right. Hey, here's the deal. I coached them to laugh at any joke that is said today, and you guys let me down. No, that was a, no, it wasn't very funny. Not a very funny joke, kind of silly, but, but it does give us a picture, a picture of what we're talking about here today, that here are some pastors, and we really are kind of holding up a sign today saying, hey, guys, this comes to us as a warning. This comes to us as a serious warning, and we as ministers, as pastors, we have to be faithful in our teaching, and the reason we have to be faithful in teaching something like this, because, you know, there, there certainly are a lot of people who are going, I don't want to hear about it, man, get the series over with, or get on to the other good stuff, but I don't want to hear about this, but, but that's the point, that's the point. The reason that you would give a warning to somebody is because you love that person, uh, just last week, you guys know the storms were coming through, and when the storms are coming through, we watch at our house, Kim and I do, if the storms come to our house, but at the same time, we're watching to see if the storms go into my son's house, and if we see that he's in the path of the storm, we're, we're, we're doing, hey, watch out, watch out, the storms are coming your way. Why would we do that? Well, because we love him, because we love him, and we want the best for him, and in the same way, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they said, tell us what's, what's going to happen. And he loves them enough to say, this is what you need to watch out for. This is what you need to be looking for. And the same for you and I. He's saying, watch for this. Look for this. And so that's where we find ourselves here in Matthew chapter 24, where we were just last Sunday, but a little further on. And we really kind of left uh, or picking up where we left off with uh, uh, Brad when he sang that song, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. And, uh, and this is where that song basically came from, and you'll recognize some of the words in it. Matthew 24, starting at verse 40, Jesus says, Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. 
Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. So here we look at this scripture, and there were two words in that, and maybe you find it there at home in your own Bible, but a couple words that I think jump out of us at us automatically is the word to watch, but then also the word job. And what does that mean? Well, it gets us to what I call the point of this prophecy. Why is he telling us this? Just for us to get a bunch of information, to have the information? No, it's more than that, right? And it's that word watch, and it's that word work. Write this down somewhere in your Bible, or maybe if you're taking notes. The point of this prophecy is that we should be watching and we should be working. We should be at watch and we should be at work. Let's talk about that word at watch first. What does that mean to you guys? When, uh, how can we watch? for? What are we watching for? Any ideas there? I think, you know, I automatically think in, in a military context, like somebody has to stay up and, and watch at night, and, you know, you have different shifts and, and keep out for, for whatever's coming, but, you know, somebody has to be alert to whatever threats are coming. And, and so we read these verses, and we see what's coming, and I think it's important to alert each other and make sure that we know where things are headed, but, um, but also just for ourselves to pay attention and, and know that when we see what the Bible talks about, we'll know it when we see it. That's a good point. With uh, Somebody has to stay up, right? Somebody has to be on that watch. And, and, and that makes me think also of the fact that could it be that, that, that by and large, even the church uh, has started to get a little sleepy, started to slumber, and maybe not been so careful in that watch. I remember when I was in, in seminary, um, uh, Jody was, uh, went to the same seminary I did, but we were in seminary, and, and this was kind of one of those jokes, but we had a, a buddy named Rob, and uh, we're sitting in one of those long, boring classes, and Rob started to do that, you know, the, the nod. And, uh, and, and so my, my buddy Mike leaned over, and he goes, hey, hey, wake him up and tell him the professor just asked him to pray. And so we went for it, and sure enough, Rob was sneezing, and I bumped him like that, wakes up like that, hey, he just asked you to pray. And sure enough, Rob fell for it, hook, line, <laughs> singer, stood up in class and started to pray just like that. Everybody, the professor didn't know what was on, just looked at him, paused for a little bit. Rob prayed, he finished praying, sat back down. Professor picked up like nothing else had happened. But, but uh, it makes me think about, you know, here, 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 what if we're caught off guard like that, you know? What if we're caught sleeping? Um, what, what, would, what do we do? I mean, we, we've got to be the ones out watching. We've got to be on guard. We've got to be those who are aware of what's going on. But uh, Brooks, I'm sorry, I think you yeah, something. Yeah, totally being prepared. You think of the military, James. I lived in South Florida 25 years. I think hurricanes. Oh, yeah. And you'd get a hurricane watch and then a hurricane warning. But when that would happen, everybody in South Florida is glued to the TV because you know something's coming. And again, you want to make sure that those that aren't are know. And um, we lived there when Hurricane Andrew came through and there was a newscaster, a weatherman named Brian Norcross. And he had a bunker set up in case the big one came. Well, Hurricane Andrew was the big one. Every other newscast was gone. And he was there talking to people from his little bunker and we were all watching him uh, forever. And it's because he knew it was going to come so he did what he thought was necessary, and he was really the only one that was ready for that. But because of that, he got huge news. He then got picked up by the Weather Channel because he was the biggest thing going on, but he helped keep us safe. That's awesome. What an what a illustration. He watched, and because he was watching, he was also working, getting ready for what was coming. He was the only one ready when it did happen. So often Jesus refers to his coming as a thief in the night. And uh, the very implication of that is people will be sleeping and they will not be ready. And so you watch and you work. What, is, what else is some of that work, might, what might that work look like? Because I think through something like we're going through right now, this pandemic, um, it's caused all of us to have to be still for a moment, uh, maybe to, to sit there and go, what am I doing? Why am I doing it? Reevaluation of our priorities. Because I think when we look, and especially what we're about to go through here now, 
if we truly believe the words of Jesus and we believe the word that is written here, if we truly believe that, would that not be a, big, a, a dramatic reevaluation of our priorities in life? Wouldn't that not change things up for us maybe a little bit as to what we're going to be about and what we're going to spend our time doing uh, here and now? What does some of that work, what, what might that work look like? Well, Jesus told us, you know, the work of God is that you believe in his son whom you sent. And so our work is to be sure everybody knows. Everybody knows that they can believe. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit last week. The gospel will spread throughout the entire world. And uh, the world will have heard. And then he comes back, Jesus said. And so that work leading up to that is us spreading that good news and spreading that word. And uh, it's even, I hope it's something that, that uh, we feel here, it, 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 it's felt, whatever living room you're sitting in there, that, that uh, the, the heaviness or the weight of all of this is not just, I, I want to know where I'm going to be, but it's also, I want to know where you're going to be, and I want to know where you're going to be, those around us, those near us, and the necessity for us not to, not to go, ah, they probably don't want to hear this stuff. And not to slough it off or say they wouldn't be interested or uh, I don't want to be embarrassed by, by them thinking I'm a religious nut of some sort. But we, we, we see the heaviness and the weight of this and it pushes us or it moves us to, you know what, I, I really don't care. I really want you to know and I really want you to know. I want you to be sure. And so that needs to be the work that is heavy on us here now. Hey guys, let's take a look at what I call uh, uh, major events major events that we see laid out before us in Revelation and other parts of the Bible. And, uh, and you can just probably write down these words that are given, and I'm going to ask uh, the pastors to go through some of the research that they have done in looking through um, various passages of Scripture. And uh, as you look at this, just take a minute and read through the Scripture, and then we'll, we'll get to the who's what, when, and where of, uh, of, of certain things. And we're, of course, I think we're gonna begin with the rapture now. In beginning with the rapture, I'm just gonna begin by saying there are theologians that argue when the rapture comes. Uh, they're, they're what you would uh, call pre-trib, uh, post-trib, mid-trib. And there's, there's lots of, and the, the, the honest thing today is basically I want everybody to know that we really don't know. Um, we really don't know. Um, we have a good idea according to what God's word says, and this is what I would believe, but, uh, but there are good theologians arguing on, on, on all different sides. And so we're doing the best that we can saying this is what we would probably uh, think and believe, and so that's how we're giving you to them today. And so with that, we begin with the rapture. You can write down the words, the rapture. And uh, Pastor Brooks, I think you got a little bit on this, don't you? Yeah, I do. And Pastor Brother, there's a great point that we just need to be loving and kind whether people agree with when it happens or not. <laughs> just like we've had people that agree with when we open or not. We just need to be loving and yeah. kind with people that disagree. But we do believe one way, and I'll share that a little bit. The rapture is what we call when um, the believers are called up to heaven. If you take a look at it, and by the way, I would encourage everybody, 1 Thessalonians 4, read the entire chapter. 1 Thessalonians 5, read the entire chapter. And that way you can see the things that are there. And even 1 Corinthians 13, so I hope you're writing these down. Those are some great passages. The rapture of the church here, it starts with the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout, voice the archangel, and those who have died will rise from their graves. The dead in Christ will rise first, then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds. It totally sounds like something out of fantasy or science fiction, but so does a virgin birth and somebody that comes back from the dead and somebody that parts the Red Sea. Uh, God's done that before. And we totally believe that this is the very next thing that's going to be happening on uh, God's plan. I was talking with Glenn, Earl, Pastor Glenn earlier, and a lot of the signs of the times that people know about, that's talking about the second coming, which we believe is seven years after the rapture. So the rapture is getting really close. The rapture is a time for believers where we are caught up together with those that have gone on before. It's a time where uh, it says in 1 Corinthians 15 that our mortality, our mortal bodies, will be changed into immortal bodies. And so we believe that the Lord's going to come down. Um, if you take a look at 1 Thessalonians 5, you'll see why we even believe that it happens before the tribulation, because it says that God has not appointed us to wrath. And in the context, the wrath is talking about the tribulation. Um, so we'll be saved from that. Somebody last week online asked if we were in the tribulation right now. I was like, no, because we're here. And the tribulation is going to be way worse than that. It's going to start with the rapture where hundreds of millions 
of believers all around the world will disappear suddenly. We think that this pandemic has set us back. Can you imagine what's going to happen to the world when hundreds of millions of people disappear right away? So that's what the rapture is. We don't know exactly when it's going to happen. Um, I trusted Christ as my Savior in the 70s. And back then, uh, USSR and everything, Soviet, the Cold War, and we're like, this world's not going to last 10 more years. We're all going to be blown up. That's what we thought. So we thought it was going to happen then. And then in 1988, people were like, oh, now the rapture's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. But it's going to happen. And that's the key thing of, of being prepared. The thing I love best about this, it says that we'll be caught up together with those that have gone before us to meet the Lord in the air. And how great is that? I have a boy that died in a car wreck about 15 years ago, and I have not seen him for 15 years. And I look forward to that reunion. And if the rapture happens while I'm alive, we'll be caught up together. And it says that's how we'll be with the Lord forever. So what a great reunion. I know a lot of us are looking forward to the day when we can come back to church and be together. That's going to be a great reunion. But this reunion is going to be so much better. Uh, that all of us will be caught up and we'll be with the Lord together. So, Butch, like you had said, that's the key thing, folks. you got to trust Jesus as your only hope. Jesus is the way. You place your faith in him alone. Then you get to be a part of that because this rapture is for the church. It's for the, those that have trusted Jesus as their Savior already. And we don't know when it's going to happen, but you need to be ready for it. And it's going to be great. So encourage one another. Great. Thanks, Brooks. I appreciate that. And also, um, while we're at it, um, uh, what it, I know because some people don't want to be people to be deceived, but what if somebody does come along and say, hey, I can tell you right when the rapture is going to happen. It's going to be on this day. It's going to, what, what would we say to that? Um, can I contribute? Yeah, this? please. I'm <laughs> asking. Um, well, I would just offer that um, even Christ <laughs> didn't know. So if that was uh-huh. not, um, that information was not given to him, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be given to some guy who exactly. comes up with a date. So exactly. Thank you. <laughs> You're exactly right, Mandy. Exactly right. And so that's a good, a good warning. Um, in fact, uh, we've seen it happen over and over. And Neil, I think you're going to talk about this a little bit later of, of how that there are those who come along and they're able to deceive people. And one of the ways they do is they say, hey, I, I've I figured it out mathematically or I, I've gotten a special word uh, that even Jesus didn't get. And, and I can tell you when it's going to happen and there'll be people that follow. And uh, we have to be aware of that. Uh, be very careful because nobody knows, Jesus said, not even the Son. Exactly, Manny. Thank you so much for that. But then after the rapture, we move on to the tribulation that, uh, Brooks, you referred to a little bit earlier, this seven-year period of time. James, tell us a little bit about the tribulation. Yeah, so uh, the tribulation is really, really scary. Um, There's a a verse I want to share with you. This comes from Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 to 17. It says, And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to survive and so we read these scary verses in revelation that talk about people wanting to die asking the rocks to fall on them and crush them and and it's very scary and one of the things to think about at times like this is that there are people who will use the scariness of that passage to manipulate people Um, I don't know how many of you guys saw it. Netflix just released a a dramatization called Waco, and it's a a retelling of the Waco story. This guy named David Koresh in 1993 had all these people in a commune in Texas, and and they were just doing some crazy things, and the government got involved, and they had this shootout, and it was horrific and tragic. But I learned, I didn't know this before, that the whole thing about that was that he had an interpretation of these six or these seven seals in Revelation that are, is being talked about here in Revelation chapter six. And he was telling people, uh, the tribulation already started and I'm the Messiah and I'm gonna bring about, you know, some of the seals have already been opened and I'm gonna bring about the other seals and we all need to get together in this commune and, and wait for the seals to come. And, and he had used that to throw people off and to manipulate. And so I wanted to share, you know, we read these passages and they're, they're intense and they're also kind of hard to understand. And there are, as Pastor Bo said, a bunch of different views, but there are reasonable different views and then there are unreasonable and dangerous different views. And I want to 
kind of give a, a distinction here because I think some people misunderstand when they hear that there's a lot of different views. Um, you know, and, and so a couple of things about David Koresh. We'll, we'll call it sort of the David Koresh dangerous view of Revelation says things like the Messiah has already come and nobody noticed or the tribulation has already started and nobody noticed or for some reason, let's all get married. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to read to you a, a verse. This, this verse comes a little bit earlier in Revelation chapter six. It is the fourth seal of those seven seals. Uh, this is Revelation chapter six. I'm starting in verse seven. It says, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and behold a pale horse and its rider's name was death and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over, over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by wild beasts of the earth. And so Revelation predicts that a fourth of the earth will die. And this is early in this tribulation. Um, and I saw the same comment that Brooks mentioned about somebody asking, are we living in the tribulation? And I realized that, that these times are scary. And so people are thinking that. But when this tribulation comes, it's going to be unlike anything that has ever happened before. Um, a fourth of the earth dying in a short period of time. To put that in context, you know, this coronavirus thing is terrible and scary. And by the count I read last night, 245,000 people have died uh, from this virus around the world. And that is tragic and terrible. And it is the reason why we're taking all these measures to be as safe as we can. We want to keep that number as low as we can possibly keep it. But 245,000, to put that in perspective, is about a fourth of a million, which is about one thousandth of a billion, which is half of the number of people that the Bible tells us are going to die in the early part of the tribulation. So, so no, we're not there yet. Um, and when we're there, you'll know it. Nobody will have to tell you this is the end. Uh, same for the tribulation. You'll know it when you see it when Jesus comes back. You'll know it when you see it. Um, and so don't be put off by those types of views and those types of people that are uh, exaggerating and pretending to know something that, that the Bible just doesn't tell us. And so that's, um, you know, we can call it the David Koresh view, the Messiah has come and the tribulation has started and let's all get married. Or on the other side of that, um, I'll, we could call it maybe the Bo Adams view. And this is uh, what we believe about the tribulation. Uh, when is it going to happen? After the rapture and before the second coming, where all over the world, we talked about that, this is global. It'll be everywhere, not just one specific area. Why? God's righteous wrath. This is a time when God pours his wrath on the earth. How long is it going to be? Seven years. Who? Those who have not accepted Jesus, unbelievers. And what is the tribulation? Hell on earth. And so that's the 30,000 foot view of what's going on in the tribulation. Thanks, James. And what's so amazing about that time during the tribulation is scripture says that people, you would think they would immediately go, oh, I better get right. Uh, I better change. I better, but in, instead there are many, scripture says their heart just gets hardened during that period of time. And, uh, and that really leads us then to the second coming when Jesus does come and the battle that does take place. And so um, that's what I want you to speak on, if you will, Butch, um, a little bit about the second coming of Christ now in the battle of Armageddon, okay? Yeah, and you would think after tribulation, it couldn't get worse. Well, it gets worse. And, uh, and it, it, I wanted to read the passage too from that. Just listen to what it says. It says, then I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. A rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire and his head with, were many crowns. You know, this is the coming of, of the Lord, but to understand, and this is, this is not the coming of the Lord, the rapture, which uh, Brooks had talked to before, where he came for his church and he comes in the clouds. This time he actually comes to the earth and he's coming in judgment. I want you to know he's coming to judge the world. And as bad as the tribulation has been, 
you, you realize that, that the only way to say that the coming of the Lord is going to be bloody. It's going to, it, the, the Bible literally says that he, he, with his tongue, Christ with his tongue, he destroys all the armies of the earth. And, and so it, you just need to recognize that, that Christ is going to come back. And when he comes back to earth and judges, the earth is going to be changed somewhat. There's going to be some changes that take place in the geography of the earth. He's going he's gonna to destroy all the armies of the earth, all the unbelievers. And at that time, he'll, he'll move on into the, to the next stage, which is the millennium. But, but what's going to happen is this bar, battle of Armageddon. And just so you know about the battle of Armageddon, it is the war between Christ and the, the armies of heaven. Although I always tell people the armies of heaven don't actually get involved. They're just along for the ride. Jesus does all the, all the, the fighting. But... It's against them and all the, all, the, uh, all the nations that have gathered together to do battle with the Lamb. And this takes place in, in Armageddon, which is really the battle. It's the, the Valley of Megiddo. It's about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. It's a huge, huge valley between two mountain areas. And uh, Napoleon actually said it's the area for the greatest warfare of all time. But it's this war. This is going to take place. It's going to, like I said, it's going to be bloody. The Bible says that the the blood will be uh, up to the horse's uh, shoulders. It's going to be where Christ is going to judge, and people are going to die. But this has to happen so that Christ can set up His kingdom. Just to give you the who, what's, and all. Who is who is the coming of Christ? Of course, it's Jesus. Jesus comes back. Uh, when does it happen? It happens immediately. At the, you know, at the end of the tribulation, as soon as the tribulation comes to the seven years, comes to the end, Christ comes back. Where does it happen? It happens on earth, like I told you in the battle of Megiddo, but recognizing that it, it's on earth. And one other thing I wanted to say about this is when, you know, we talked about people not knowing when and what. When Christ comes back to earth, he will literally uh, come to earth and he'll, he'll come from the sky and everyone will see him. Everyone on earth, the Bible says, everyone on earth will see him, okay? Um, and why is he coming? He's coming to defeat evil and, you know, and create, you know, make a world peace, set up his kingdom of peace. And then, the, but the thing you need to know about the return of Christ in this battle of Armageddon is Jesus wins. Jesus wins. It's, it's a, like I said, it's, a, it's we think of it as a, a worldwide war, but it's really over in just a, a short time. Christ comes, destroys the army, he wins, and then the next stage begins. Very good. Thank you, Butch. A lot on that, and it's really amazing. When you, when you do a little research, and I know you guys are going to be getting into it a lot um, in this Zoom class, but uh, uh, him touching down on the Mount of Olives mm -hmm. and uh, splitting the mountain from east to west and uh, a violent shaking of the earth at that moment uh, where it says even the Mediterranean will then flow uh, right. in all the way to Jerusalem. And interestingly, there is a fault line right at that very spot. And you can begin to see things and, uh, just around us that line up with what we find here already written in God's Word. And Powerful. that's another thing that, that everyone will know. Like you said, even the geography is going to be changed. It, 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 this will, the world will know when Christ comes back. And it's going, to, it's going to be, a for the believers, it's going to be a wonderful time. But for the, the unbeliever, for the nations of the earth, it's going to be a time of intense judgment. It's really um, another person who made a point one time before that uh, we are, really are now at a place in, in uh, humanity or uh, in history where uh, uh, now never before could you see everybody at the same time see something. But with technology now, everybody around the world is able to see something happening that's taking place at a particular place, which is really interesting. And uh, because before you might read this and go, how in the world could that ever happen? But you see, uh, it starts to line up like that too. Really interesting. Thanks. Appreciate that. And then, then of course, we move on um, to Judgment Day. And uh, we talk about some thrones here and so forth. But Pastor Glenn, uh, fill us in a little bit on, on the the next event, number four, Judgment Day, if you will. Yes, uh, and I'm a little concerned about Butch's presentation because I saw the movie Armageddon with Bruce Willis, and <laughs> none of that actually happened. So. <laughs> um, 
No, that was excellent. That was excellent, Butch. <laughs> um, but there will also be a judgment day. And uh, Revelation, John talks about this in his Revelation here in chapter 20, 11 through 15. I'd like to just read the passage real quick. He says, And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, the earth and the sky, fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. That is also kind of a scary passage. Uh, the Jesus actually kind of talks about this in Matthew 25, and we see him describing what will happen on the judgment. But uh, it, is, it is scary. One thing to remember is that John, who got this revelation and wrote it down, also wrote the Gospel of John. And he wrote John 3.16, which is the gospel in, a, in one really powerful verse, uh, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not perish and have eternal life. So we, we see a couple things here. One, that people will be judged according to their deeds, but we have to weigh that with the gospel message, which is very clear that we're not saved by our deeds. Uh, we are saved by faith in Christ, and Jesus is the one who did the work on the cross. And so we're not saved by our good deeds, but our good deeds are evidence that we have a relationship with Christ. Our good deeds show that we do have the Holy Spirit in us and that we have a relationship with Christ and that the Holy Spirit begins to live through us and begins to love through us. And there is fruit there that, that, that can be seen um, when we have a relationship with Christ. So the good news is that uh, while that's a scary passage, for Christians, we don't have to be afraid of the judgment. Our name is in the book of life. When I read that book of life, I think back to, uh, to school and uh, maybe, I don't know if you guys had this or not, but w when we did tryouts for sports, um, you'd try out, you'd go through the practices and everything, and then they would post a list on a wall somewhere in the school. And they'd be like, if you go look at the list and see if your name's on the list, then you made the team. Mm -hmm. And I can remember just, just shaking in my shoes going to look at the list. And I remember one time in particular, I had a terrible tryout, and I was like, man, I don't even want to look to see because I know I was not good enough to make the team. And man, all the kids got, you didn't get to look at the book all by yourself and see if you were on there. All the kids would be gathered around, and you look, am I on the list? Am I on the list? Well, this book of life is not based on whether or not we were good enough in the tryouts. This book of, of life, your name is in there because of what Jesus did on the cross. And we don't have to earn it. We don't have to be good enough. Um, but we will do good things because of our relationship with Christ. And so, uh, so there will be a judgment, but we don't, as Christians, have to fear that judgment. I love the way you put that, Glenn. Um, and it's so very important for anybody listening today um, because there will be those who will stand before God and say, well, look at all the good stuff I did. Uh, isn't this good enough? And, uh, and, and it's not. It says even our best efforts are as filthy rags. So uh, wherever you're at, um, it's so very important that you understand before the day of judgment that you must put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Trust him because it's only in him that we have that salvation. And in and, and all truth, the judgment has already been made 
for those who are in Christ, and we are found righteous and holy, and our, our, our name is written there. And so in a moment, you're going to be given that opportunity to, put, to definitely make that decision and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ so that you are indeed ready for Judgment Day. But then comes, I, I know it's been a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of scary stuff, but uh, we end with the, the good news, uh, the great news, number five. It's what we call the eternal reign of Jesus. And uh, Pastor Neil, I know you've uh, put some stuff together here to share with us. Yeah, this is when we get to see the fruit of the victory that Christ has won for us. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 21. It says, um, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And the sea was also gone, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe Every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. And then he said to them, write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, uh, to all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the spring of water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. So yeah, after the final judgment, we will have the eternal reign of Jesus Christ. And it says that, in, uh, you see in Revelations, it says that we will have a, a new heaven and a new earth. And, and this is where this will all occur. In Romans chapter 8, it talks about the earth and how that it groans as in the pains of childbirth. But during this time, all the suffering and all the things that we have experienced, they will be gone. It says we'll have no more death, no more mourning, no more weeping, no more pain, no more curses. Uh, I mean, can you imagine what that will be like? When there will be no more pain, no more death. There'll be no more coronavirus because it will be that probably the only other time the earth has been like that is during the time of Eden. And we'll be back to a time of peace and a time of restoration. The, but the thing that sticks out to me about this is what Pastor Glenn said earlier. Who, who, who will experience this? And well, all of those whose names are in the book of life. And that is why, going back to what we talked about, about at the beginning, why it's so important that we begin to do the work. Because if, if their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they don't get to experience the, this. Exactly. It, it won't be for, for them. And, um, and I wanna, the, one other thing that sticks out to me is um, what will happen here it's really, truly more than we can ever imagine. We really, because it says that God will walk among his people. His dwelling place will be here with us. And we cannot, we have no earthly understanding of what that will be like during the eternal reign of Jesus. C.S. Lewis had something interesting to say about what you're describing there, Neil. He, he said, we're, we can't even fathom or imagine it, but whereas now we have five senses, it very well may be that, that here we have a thousand senses. Uh, it would just be that much more, that much bigger, and we can't fathom that in our minds right now how amazing it will be uh, during this time. Uh, reign of Jesus Christ. That's awesome. That's so great. Um, Mandy, I got a question for you. Um, I was just reading right here. It says, it says, uh, in, in what Neil just read. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Do you remember your wedding day? I do. Do you? Yes. Let me ask, let me ask. Did it take you a while to get ready? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It was a process, right? It's a whole, yeah, it's a whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> like how sure. long? Like, um, it was a 6 p.m. wedding, and I'm pretty sure we started the day at like 8 a.m. Yeah. So that's, that's a whole thing, like, for sure. Yeah, well, I, it made me think about um, that. And I know um, on wedding day, there's a lot of prep that goes into it. I mean, even leading up to it, it's you plan it. I don't know how long yours was. You planned out months in advance and, and uh, you pick out the right dress and you go through all the process. And, 
and uh, bridesmaids, they have to get ready as well. And, and there's this whole preparation that goes into this big moment or this big day and finally getting there. And, and what a picture that is, I think, for us as the body of Christ, for us as the bride of Christ, the church. And uh, in, our, in our house, uh, Kim has this sign um, it's one of those, I think it's a Hobby Lobby sign, isn't it? Uh, and one of those signs, you know, you buy those Hobby Lobby signs and they all have quotes and sayings and everything. You stick them all around your house and, and uh, they're always half off, right? Um, I yes. think, yeah, a Hobby yes. Lobby, but yeah, stay out of Hobby Lobby. Man, I tell you. <laughs> but she got this Hobby Lobby sign and, and the, the little sign that she has in her house and set, simply says, happily ever after, happily ever after. And, and you think about... Happily ever after, it's, it's the end of all the great stories that we love, is it not? All the fairy tales. And, and, and on a wedding day, you think, certainly this is going to be happily ever after, and that's what you dream of, and that's what you hope for. Why are you laughing about that? I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, and you dream. But I think, I think that's for a reason. I think it's for a reason. I think we are hardwired to know that there really one day will be a happily ever after. And that's what we like to hear the story over and over. We can't get it out of us. Scripture even says that he has put, he set eternity in the heart of man. And so here when we come and we look at all this stuff, it, it's dramatic and it's frightening. But the good news is we get to the happily ever after part. We get to the happily ever after part and we see that that will be a reality one day, that that, that will really, really happen. And that is our hope. That is the hope that we have through something like we're going through now and through much, much worse that we see coming in the future. There is that happily ever after. And and it's a love story. It is a love story. Everything we went over today, even as scary as it sounds, is really a love story. And it's a love story for you, a love story for me. It's a love story because in this love story, there is a hero who does come along and save the day. There is a hero who comes and takes you and me, each one of us, his bride, his church, and takes us to that place that it is happily ever after. That's what we have we can look forward to. That's the good news, the good news. And it's only through Jesus Christ, taking him by the hand. And that's when you find one day that happily ever after. I want us all to bow our heads and close our eyes. Now, as we begin to, to wrap up this morning, I realize it was a whole lot of information, but the main thing I want to make sure you got this morning is that God loves you. God loves you more than you could ever dream, hope, or imagine. And yes, there is a lot of scary things that are to come. But you see, holding on to Jesus Christ, our salvation brings you through to that happily ever after place. Realizing the love that he has for you and that he went to the cross. He was the hero. He went to the cross and it's there that he bled and he died for your sin and for my sin. And he offers to each one of us, anybody who will receive it, eternal life. All we have to do is accept it, accept it, take it, believe. So right where you are this morning, maybe, maybe take a minute and talk to Jesus. And you might say something like this, say, Jesus, today I'm putting my faith and my trust in you and in only you. Thank you for dying for me in my place. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Be my God and my Savior, my friend. Pray that prayer. You mean it with your heart. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me a home in eternity with you forever and ever and ever. Best decision you could ever make. Father, I thank you so much for those who just put their faith and their trust in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have given us good news, that through all this, we keep our eyes on you. We look to you that there is that hope, there is that future, there is that glory. Thank you for that, Father. I pray that we would watch 
and we would work, Father, anybody that we might find who does not know that good news, give us the boldness to be able to share with them so they too can know. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.